successful uh, organizations uh, will need to be challenged uh, uh, in order to remain, remain successful uh, to, to take on that intergenerational challenge. And to the extent that uh, you know, the youth is the future, uh, and we've all acknowledged that, uh, to the extent that those successful organizations don't respond uh, successfully uh, to the intergenerational challenge, those organizations may start presenting some challenges uh, 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 where they may not be successful in the future. And what you might find is that you need to create your own organizations uh, that respond to the, to the needs that you're talking about. And I, I do think that there's a, a, a good thing uh, that can result from that, and that's uh, uh, making all of our organizations more responsive to the needs of, of our community. One of the uh, aggravated one of the aggravating issues with, with Latino youth and uh, leadership development is the issue of acculturation, you know, because that is an added uh, anxiety to Latinos who live in this country. Uh, we, some of us live in this hyphenated reality where we're Mexican Americans or we're Guatemalan Americans, so we, so we struggle with that. We struggle with the whole issue of defecting the culture. Um, and that in itself is, is, is a challenge in terms of leadership development. I think that one of the biggest challenges, and I think this is, this is normative for, for, for all cultures, is the issue of us, I'm 53 years old, and I think I know everything, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, you know better than that, but at least I think that. Uh, so it is, it is really an ability to move out of the way and to trust the next generation to do the job that we're doing, to understand when it's time for us to move on, and in the process of that, providing the skills that we need to give. So in the Latino, in the Latino community, there is an organization that is doing that. Uh, and I think we do that informally, but in a formal way, we're, we're doing that through, uh, through the Young Latino Network. Barbara? I think one of the areas that the African American community has failed is really to raise up and mentor and coach the next generation of leaders. And then, as Reverend Max said, for us old dogs to move aside <laughs> and let that new generation <laughs> step in and take its rightful place. I think we have. Who's old dogs? I like old dogs. <laughs> so I do not think we have done a good job. I look at the po politics and the political leaders in this community, and I don't think we, I think we've done an abysmal job mm -hmm. in raising up leaders, in mentoring in that coaching function. Right. And shame, once again, shame on us. I'm Al Lopez, I'm the Vice Chair of the Hispanic Roundtable, and I'm one of the real old dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I want to bring up a continuing issue. It's been around ever since I've been around and working in the community for so many years. Uh, it really revolves around available resources and fundings, and in specific, what is available to us uh, from public and private foundations and corporations. We get characterized as, uh, as a new minority group comes in power as uh, getting ready to fight for a bigger piece of the pie. And I think that's complete nonsense. I think what we need to do is work together and collaborate to create a bigger pie. When, the, when you look at comparable cities like Milwaukee, and you take a look at the amount of money that's being given or uh, minorities can get access to, we're way, way underrepresented in this community. So I, my question to the panel is, how can we collaborate together to create a bigger pie to get more resources for our community? You stumped them. <laughs> Any thoughts about that? Did Mr. Lopez stump my panel? Or? <laughs> I think our, our voices need to be heard at the county level, and we need to really get involved more uh, in unison to be part of many of the conversations that are happening. Because we, 
I don't know if it is, it is intentional or not that we're played sometimes as separate communities. We're never seen as one. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, out of this opportunity of being together today, uh, us taking on every step that we take, you know, that's it in our mind saying, every time that I go through something where I can reach or I can reach out, making it now part of our habit, hopefully we'll make a change after living here today that each one of us takes that approach of carrying the voices together than rather to continue to go alone and separate ways. Joe? Al's about a relationship, but thanks Al for the question. <laughs> <laughs> I think part of it is that if we stood together and we have to reciprocity with some of these big corporate guys and said, if you want something from us, we want something from you. And I think if we do that together and we actually lock our arms, they'll say, we gotta deal with this issue. The corporate is gonna have to deal with us. And right now, it's easier for them to divide and pick apart. We, you know, we know what's happening, but I guarantee you, if we went together and said, you know, well, this is the buying power of the Hispanic community, and it's $380 billion, you better take recognition of that. And if you go and you say the, the African American community is $380 billion, you know, or whatever that may be, the numbers may be. You know, someone's going to say, you know what, the board of directors and the shareholders are going to are going to hurt if if we give them resistance. And right now, we're allowing us, allowing them to pick us apart and say, we'll fund this community or this this group, and we'll fund this one here. Let them share on the spoil that's there instead of putting it together and say that's not enough. Yeah. There there are some um, really clear examples of that if you look back. I was actually in California, UC Riverside, and there was actually a conversational dialogue very similar to this. And they talked about during the 70s when <coughs> you had a black power movement, you had a Chicano movement in Southern California and how the two communities came together to really evoke change. And I think that now we're in 2009 and I think that there's an opportunity because there is a as you said, a pie that we can create that's larger to pull from. I think if we go back to that same principle of understanding, then I think we can do that. Developing an agenda that one works for uh, both communities, something that we find or have in common so that we can put forth and say to these corporations or foundations or whoever, like, this is our agenda. These are the three things that we, are, we both agree on and we're going to move forward together in a unified point. I think that we have a better opportunity of creating something that is, is a lot more impactful than probably anybody in this room ever even imagined. Well, today at the City Club, we've been listening to a panel Discussion featuring Barbara Danforth, Diana Del Rosario, Raymond Hedden, Joe Lopez, Reverend Max Rodas, and Terry Travis. Uh, thank you, panelists, and uh, I'd like to thank all of you again for coming. Uh, I want to close by also saying that tonight is not an end, but actually a beginning of what we hope will be a series of ongoing dialogues uh, between the two communities. Uh, we hope that uh, you enjoyed the program, and I would ask each of you in the audience tonight if you would do one thing before leaving meet someone of a different race and introduce yourself before you leave. And uh, we'll conclude with that. Thank you all. Thanks again to the Hispanic Roundtable and Policy Bridge. And good evening. <laughs>